You're listening to WITF's Morning Edition. I'm Tim Lambert with Katie Meyer. Good morning, Tim. The reason Katie is joining me today is to help kick off the latest WITF Real Life, Real Issue series. This one is focusing on Cumberland County's juvenile justice system, which, for those that don't know, deals with children between the ages of 10 and 18 who commit a crime. WITF was provided with unique access to take an inside look at the system. Last year, 169 dispositions of juveniles took place in the county. That's the lowest number by far since 2009. The juvenile system in Pennsylvania is often misunderstood, mainly because it operates behind closed doors due to the confidentiality involved to protect the identity of the child. Like any courtroom proceeding in the state, there are no cameras or audio recordings allowed. So for the last seven months, Tim has been sitting in on hearings in the county, talking to the many people and agencies involved in such cases, and even following one offender through the system. That's right, Katie. It was a fascinating look at just how different the juvenile justice system is from the criminal system for adults, from how cases are handled to the different lingo used. We don't convict. We adjudicate. Uh, we find people in need of, of treatment, and we have disposition, finding of fact hearings instead of trials. That's Cumberland County District Attorney David Freed. So to try to illustrate just how different it is, Katie and I will walk you through just what exactly happens from when an offender is cited to the closing of the case. It's the first of four stories we'll bring you this week. When a juvenile is suspected of a crime, he or she is issued a written allegation filed by police, in most cases known as a referral. It's sent to the Cumberland County Juvenile Probation Department. Sam Miller, can I help you? We might get the initial call the night of the arrest from the police requesting detention, and we receive the report immediately, and so we're involved from the onset. Sam Miller has been the county chief probation officer for the last 14 years. I believe that of all the pieces in the system, none are more important than the juvenile probation officer because they see them on a weekly basis, sometimes multiple times a week. They'll be involved in counseling sessions as well as drug testing. It could be checking to see if they're attending school regularly. One of the county juvenile probation officers in Miller's office is Frank Shardle. He says an assessment is conducted on each offender at what is known as the intake level. Technically, it's called a YLS assessment. Uh, we use that scale to measure what, are, what is the likeliness of them reoffending in the community. It also specifies particular areas that we should focus on, such as personality and behavior, education and employment. When a case is filed with the court, it goes to the DA's office. Freed, who's held the office for a dozen years, personally approves all referrals and makes an initial recommendation on how to proceed. When he recommends the case for court, a juvenile petition is created and the DA's office presents the case in court to the judge. We have a role to play uh, as the representative of the public and to the extent that we need to have finding of fact hearings, uh, we, we prosecute the cases. He says it can go one of four ways, including an immediate dismissal. We can choose to divert the case uh, in a couple of different ways, or I can say uh, I want us, us to seek an adjudication on a particular charge or the charges, and then that would set the case up to come in front of the judge where we would have a finding of fact hearing. Freed notes the majority of cases involve children who have never been in trouble. Our fondest hope is if we have a juvenile who gets in trouble that we can, we can positively impact that juvenile's system and make sure they don't come back. That's true success. On the other side of each case is making sure every juvenile offender has counsel. Tim, you remember one of the worst judicial scandals in U.S. history, Kids for Cash in Luzerne County. He and another judge are accused of taking millions from the builder and owner of a private juvenile jail. But what's important to note is many of the juveniles involved were not represented by counsel or advised of their rights. So changes were made, and that's no longer the case in Pennsylvania. Under state law, every juvenile between 10 and 18 charged with a criminal offense has a right to free counsel. Now, if a family doesn't hire an attorney, this guy steps in. Ron Toro, uh, Cumberland County Juvenile Defender. I am the, uh, the advocate and attorney for the child. He notes it's a limited jurisdiction court to try to give children an opportunity to go through the system, try to deal with any underlying issues that led to a criminal offense, and come out of it without a criminal record. In our world, if, if a juvenile is found to have committed offense, it's called an adjudication of delinquency, and they can be placed on probation or even placed out of home if necessary. 
children have the same rights, like the right to remain silent and the right to be tried in front of a judge. The Commonwealth must also prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Turo says the system focuses on trying to make sure these kids get the services they need, come out of it better than they entered it, and down the road not commit any other offenses as juveniles or adults. We've taken more of a, a pro-community and a pro-victim approach in the last several years, and that's been very good, and it should be, because children need to understand the consequences, that it's not just, you know, okay, you did something bad or we're going to focus on you. If it does end up being tried, there are no juries involved just a judge. I am Tom Placey. I'm a common pleas judge here in Cumberland County. Placey says he often has to determine if there's probable cause that the juvenile committed an act of delinquency. If he finds a child committed a criminal offense, he must then determine if the offender is in need of treatment, supervision, and rehabilitation. Only then can he adjudicate them delinquent and impose a disposition like probation. And then if I determine that, then we go to determine whether the per juvenile needs to be in a placement, a detention, a secure facility, or whether there's a way we can safely put them back into a home environment. After that probable cause determination is made, we go to what's known as a finding of fact hearing. I have to make a determination beyond a reasonable doubt whether that juvenile committed the delinquent acts charged. Placey also takes recommendations from a number of people involved in a particular case, like the juvenile's counselor or probation officer. These are the cases that cause me to lose sleep Sunday night when I'm thinking how I'm going to decide certain things. I don't want to throw any child away. There's hope for every child. Once a judge rules a juvenile committed an offense after an adjudicatory hearing or finding of fact, the path could lead to a number of things. Probation, community service and fees and restitution, or placement at a facility such as rehab. Now that you've had a chance to learn about how the juvenile justice system works, over the next three days you'll hear about one offender as she makes her way through the system. That's right, Katie. I followed 18-year-old Brandy Kiefer for the last six months, from her adjudication of delinquency hearing to finding out if she successfully completed the terms of her probation. The first part of her story, how she ended up in juvenile court, will air tomorrow on WITF's Morning Edition. Support for Real Life, Real Issues, Juvenile Justice comes from the Cumberland County Bar Foundation. 